Hello, and welcome to the Rebecoming the One Symposium. Um, I am Vanessa Nixon, and I'm here with Martha Alter Hines today, co hosting week one, The Divine Feminine. And I am so excited today that we get to speak with Katrina Blanca. So, welcome, Katrina. Hi, and I just realized, just for people to have an easier time knowing who I am, I also put my story name. <laughs> so, so privileged and honored to be with you ladies and looking forward to whatever wants to unfold. <laughs> oh, this is going to be just a really lovely talk, I can tell. And I want to give everybody just a little bit of background on you. So I would love to um, read a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, Katrina Blanca lives and works in southern Germany. As a storyteller, her main focus is finding traces of the divine feminine in traditional stories and retelling them. Katrina also works as a healer. The combining of story and sound for healing is her joy and passion. And today she's going to be talking about traces of her telling stories about the divine feminine. I just want to say I'm so, I've been looking forward to this talk for, I don't know, since we first connected two or three months ago. <laughs> super, super, super excited. And I know there are many layers to this. Um, one, one layer that I hope we can touch on at some point is also your connection to landscape and storytelling with landscape and and that the connection of that to the divine feminine too and anyway so many <laughs> so many ways we can go with this but mm. <clears throat> so so yeah so you when I asked you to be part of this symposium um you came up with this topic traces of her connecting with the divine feminine through story and um maybe we could just start with what does that mean to you why does that come up for you what I'm asking a whole bunch of questions at the same time I'm sorry but <laughs> answer right. it in whatever way you like I would love to hear um why why does this matter to you what I can mean I know I can feel it in you that this does matter to you clearly on many levels and and I would maybe we can just start with that what is mm -hmm. what's your passion about with this and what does it mean yeah. for you <clears throat> mm -hmm. so the title comes from um a project that I'm that I'm involved in which is a beautiful duo with a Scottish storyteller named Kirsten Milliken and together we form the Hedge Sisters and uh since 2020 we've been telling stories together and um we've both been very drawn to telling her story so to to find find interesting stories about feminine characters about goddesses women uh natural beings um and and try and tap into the wisdom of the divine feminine and then the title just appeared to me it was like traces of her and we did we did a one four part series over the course of of a year where every few months we would um have an online storytelling event about one specific element say we started with water, I believe, and then we found stories connected, you know, to that. And so stories about water, about oceans, about, you know, there was the mother of the sea and there was the fisher woman and there were all kinds of stories with the watery element. And we would weave in song and meditation. And then the next one was fire. And then we had earth and air. And this year, what we did was places of her which there's one installment left. I'll talk about that later maybe and, and tell people where to find it. Where we continued in this vein, but we looked at specific places, place types, such as mountains, forests, and bogs so far. And the last one we'll do is shores. And so this is this has been going on and I, I dearly love Kirsten and our work and um, it's deepened my connection to something I already knew was there 
So I've been, you know, I've been an artist and freelancer for over 10 years as a singer songwriter, mostly. Um, I have a theater background. Um, and I, I also did, I, I gave theater trainings and workshops and all, I, I've done all kinds of things. Um, and I've done women's circles. I've, I've done my own training and, you know, all these aspects of being a woman. And then all of a sudden it just came together with my artistic work in this way that I found, wow, um, even in the storytelling world, the, the narrative about the hero still sort of seems to be <laughs> at the forefront, which is odd because, I mean, yeah, the feminine is on the rise and still we keep telling those old stories. And so we're keep, we keep enforcing something, most of us unaware, because they're great stories and I don't want to erase them, yet I want to balance them. And so, yeah, there's been a lot of rich work going on, which I'm excited to share as we go on. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for that background. You know, this is the first time I'm meeting you. And so I'm really loving, you know, to kind of get a picture of how all of these things have woven together uh, for you and um, have come come together to create what you know what you are expressing into the world and it's just absolutely beautiful and I resonate with so many pieces it's like oh I want to ask her about this and this and this <laughs> um and um I guess what's what's coming to me is something that you said a little bit earlier before we started recording that really um just kind of lit me up and and that was you were uh speaking about storytelling as medicine and i would love to delve deeply into that because i think that kind of encompasses a lot of what you've been saying and so how how is storytelling medicine from your perspective <laughs> <clears throat> First of all, storytelling works with symbols, right? So one example being the hero's journey. Some of, of the listeners might be familiar with that. Joseph Campbell's uh, brilliant discovery of, you know, you have the hero or heroine and they go into the underworld, they face some kind of a challenge and they gain a treasure and they come back up and then they are faced with the ordinary world again and they have to see is this something that I can now carry forward and and you find these symbols in all stories like everywhere and so for example just to, to try and narrow this down because I know this talk could be like hours um but with my work and the divine feminine um so for example you have the chalice holy grail the tower it's all it's all different symbols pointing to the feminine womb and so if i do tell a story without my even you know doing anything special these symbols are there and they work their own magic in the subconscious so that's that's one one aspect the second aspect that's really dear to me and a lot of storytellers that I know is that storytelling is personal. It happens between the listener and the teller. And it is done, there's a Scottish wonderful proverb um, that I often get mixed up, don't, you know, don't tie me to the order, but it's something like stories are told face to face, eye to eye and heart to heart. So the story always changes depending on who's there. And it also changes depending on my state of being in that moment. And it's very different, I find, from theater. And I can compare the two, given my background. And so even though I might rehearse a story, um, still I have to remain open to whatever wants to come through me. Different wordings you know, slight changes, pauses in different uh, 
pauses at different um, times, interactions with the with the audience, um, and there's a medicine in that, in itself. And third aspect is that, you know, we all have different stories that we've lived, right? So, and we all have different stories that we tell ourselves about who we are. And then that meets a story that is told. And it will call forth different aspects of growth, of healing, that the specific soul needs at that specific time. And I've done I've done storytelling gigs where I would tell a story about the divine feminine and then I would pause and invite my audience to meditate for a while, for example, or to share with a partner or even share if somebody felt called to do so with the wider audience. What has this brought up? Or, you know, do, do you know this kind of thing that the heroine or the hero faces in that moment? Do you know this? Like, how does this imply? What does this imply for you? And the richest discussions come from that. And the deepest sort of, yeah, explorations. Because it isn't framed as therapy <laughs> to be, you know, to be blunt. Um, but it is art. It is an artistic process. And the person themselves can decide how deeply to jump in or to just sit back and just listen. And that's everything is allowed. And that's something I find very, very healing with it. Yeah, if there's good storytelling going on. Um, yeah, I was getting chills, like on the verge of crying from so many things you've been sharing. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, one of the many questions I feel coming up for me is, <clears throat> um, can you give some examples of when you talk about the hero's journey and the typical stories that get told? compared with the stories related to the divine feminine that you you focus on can you can you give us like a little bit of a comparison I think I think some of it is obvious but maybe not so obvious and I would love to hear more yeah mm -hmm. I just see what comes up mm. Well, let's stick with Hygieia, why don't we? Oh. So for those who <laughs> those who don't know, um, just briefly, I want to share how I met you, Martha. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a goddess project that I've been doing for half a year now um, because sometime last summer, I, I just received a download um, telling me, okay, you have to do this. You have to do 12 months of encountering a different goddess every month and then tell a story about her. And so I've created something in my shop where people can buy this package and, and I embarked and I had no idea about the goddesses that would show up. Like I'm not a planner person. <laughs> so I was just like, okay, let's channel this, which has on one hand led to a lot of work that I wasn't expecting, but on the other hand, to magnificent encounters. And I had not heard about Hygieia uh, before and the, the, yeah, and I was faced with, okay, which goddess is going to be the next? And I think it was in March. And then in February, a friend posted something on Facebook about Hygieia, this goddess, right? And I was like, oh, what's this? And I, oh, I dived in and then I researched and I went really far with my research. And I found you, Martha. I found this whole astrological side to this goddess, which I had no idea about. I did not know that asteroids are named after goddesses. And your video just, yeah, sparked so many things. And then I just reached out and asked, could you, could we meet? Is this possible? Can you share? And then we did and all these things developed. And so what I found with Hygieia is that, so for those who don't know her, um, she is the goddess of preventive medicine right? So she's the one to turn to 
in yourself and outside of yourself when you want to guard your health as opposed to battling illness because it's already got you. <laughs> and then I researched her and I, the first thing that you find is, oh, she was Asclepius's wife. And Asclepius is known to many more people because he's the guy with the staff and the snakes that you have on the, the apothecary signs in Germany and, you know. Okay, and because I've been on this path for a while, whenever I hear, okay, this goddess is, is the wife or the sister or the daughter of this god, my ears start ringing and I'm like, okay, who says this and since when? And what was she before? <laughs> and Hagia is a great example um, because you can find the traces of her in oh. ancient Crete mm. and, that's, mm -hmm. and that's way before Asclepius ever appeared on the scene and there was on Crete there was a, a temple um, where they had goddess worship and they had snakes and the snakes according to the research I found and anybody knowing better, please do share. Like I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't know it all. This is just the, the stage that I'm at with my research, but apparently they kept the snakes as a kind of a warning system because on Crete, you had a lot of um, earthquakes and flooding and fires and you name it, it was there. And the first to know were the snakes and when they left people know knew okay let's leave the the house we'd have to go to open plains to try and survive so that's a that's a very back to symbols that's a very preventive measure to take wow. Wow. i did not know about that that is amazing yes <laughs> you, you can i think you get my my drift and and this is just one example and then yeah, and then all of a sudden she's sort of exported to the mainland Greece. And then all of a sudden you find, oh, uh, Hygieia was worshipped in Asclepius's temples and and all these things. And, and with this specific example, maybe I can share a little about the work that I then did because there are no stories that I could find about this goddess. There's tons about Asclepius, but nothing about her. And so I had to go really deep and I, I found an account about the statesman Pericles who apparently built, rebuilt Athena's temple on the Acropolis. And there's a tiny, tiny mention about, um, uh, 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 how do you say that in English? Uh, a craftsman employed at the temple who had an accident fell and became really ill and then all work came to a standstill because the other workers said no, this is a bad omen we will not continue and then apparently Pericles uh, went to the temple into the sanctuary where there's a huge golden statue of Athena and he slept in the temple and in his dream Athena appeared and gave him all the instructions how to heal this worker, which he then did, and the worker was healed and work continued. And it is said that he, in the end, put up a statue of Athena Hygieia in honor of this incident. But this is like three sentences worth <laughs> in, a, in a massive text about ancient Greece. And then I go, well, this is, this is cool. And I dive in and I dream into this. And then I created a story from this because I found another symbol, which is the temple sleep, the so-called, which we know happened in, in Asclepius temples and also in Hygieia temples, which is somebody who was ill would go into the temple, extensively wash their body, which is also a very preventive measure given our view of those times, you know, they didn't wash, did they? Um, and then they would sleep in the temple, asking for guidance in their dreams from the god or goddess about how to heal themselves. 
So I find this in that story. And that so that's what I mean by traces of her. And when I go all the way back, it also points to Crete being a site where they did temple sleep. Period. <laughs> wow, that is amazing. Thank you so much for giving that example because um, I, I was wondering, you know, what your perspective was going to be on that particular question that, that Martha asked about um, because I, you know, I love Joseph Campbell and I love all the stories. And then, you know, sometime later in my life, I started realizing like, okay, but they're all very masculine oriented. <laughs> like where are the, all the goddess stories? And so, <clears throat> um, what I also love about this particular example that you gave was that it was about Hygieia and as an herbalist, um, you know, I feel very resonant with her. One of the very first um, herbal books that I bought decades ago was called Hygieia, written by uh, Parvati. I can't remember her last name at the moment, but it was a book about women's health. Um, and it was kind of one of those books that was shunned by the mainstream as, you know, a little bit too out there. <laughs> um, so I, I love that that was the example that you gave. And a question comes up for me, and I don't know if this is a silly question, but I wonder if you, um, if you hear this or if you see this a lot in your work. Um, you, you talked a lot about the symbolism. And I happen to be one of those people who I've always loved mythology. I've always loved that kind of storytelling. Um, but I'm also very literal. And I don't catch the symbolism until it's pointed out to me. And I'm wondering if you have either like some advice for people who are really interested in this, but just aren't tuned into the symbolism, like how can we tune into that symbolism so that we can understand those deeper meanings, you know, that are kind of below the surface or does it even matter? <laughs> the first impulse that came was, does it even matter? <laughs> so yes, at the moment, I find myself on this path of wanting to understand, you know, symbols and, 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 and find the connections. But it has a specific purpose for me of telling the stories better. And one thing I love about storytelling is precisely this. We do not have to analyze them. Like, a good teller will have you magically enveloped <laughs> um, without going and I know what the story means that and that to me is a is a distinction between a good teller and somebody who's still on their path is can I as a teller step back enough to trust that the story will do its thing in each person according to where they are at and that might also mean I have to endure the fact that somebody is triggered big topic <laughs> um different story but and it might mean that I go away going oh what did they take I, I can't tell <laughs> but it's not my job my job is to put the story to them well and to tell it from my heart as well as I'm able at that point um as, as to advice, I'm not a, a great advice giver, but what I found from my own experience is that story will take you by the hand if you are open. So if, if you find yourself even asking this question, Vanessa, then my, my instinct says, well, you're already like, you're on your way, like <laughs> trust that stories will come at the appropriate moment in the appropriate way without you having to grasp them or 
go and read lots of books on symbolism. <laughs> Wow. That makes so much sense. And as a, as a naturopath, someone who uses a lot of different healing modalities, um, I can <clears throat> kind of relate it to that in that there's there are so many levels of healing. And I also have to trust that if I'm doing my job well, then the person that I'm working with will receive the healing on whatever level they are at and whatever healing they need at that particular time. And it's not really my job to say, oh, well, there was, there's more healing here or there's another level um, because I have to meet them where they are and the medicine is going to meet them where they are and give them what they need in that specific moment. And so I love, um, I love the way that you have described storytelling, uh, doing the exact same thing. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree. And I love, I love this talk. Thank you so much. This is so much fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm having like, well, I'm having a bazillion thoughts and feelings, but I think there are two or three points that I wanted to bring up. Um, one is that uh, in in my work with goddesses and with astrology and with all kinds of things, <clears throat> one of my biggest values in it is emphasizing the power of story, the power of narrative. So, like, so in the astrology world, there are I would, I would say the, well, I don't know, the majority of the astrology world that I'm familiar with tends to take the myths uh, associated with various planetary bodies and, um, and repeats those stories over and over again, you know, as, as we think they were told at whatever point we think they were told. So like, for example, Saturn, right? There's this very, typical approach to Saturn as being associated with patriarch, with the domineering kind of violent narrative. And so for example, I gave a talk not that long ago about Saturn as yin and Saturn actually being uh, related to the feminine principle and uh, Saturn being a holder of structure and space but in a gentle very subtle way um and what's important to me about that isn't so much like which version is right or wrong but it's more the the recognition that whatever we choose whatever meaning we choose to give to a story has actual impact on our health <laughs> on our emotional well-being all kinds of like, like for example in astrology I've seen so many people look at a chart and say, oh my God, Pluto is going to blah, 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 to my blah, 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 or Saturn is going to blah, 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 to my blah, 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 or even Hygieia is about to conjunct my whatever. And, and actually people can have panic attacks and actually have you know major anxiety because of the story that they think is being told by the astrology. And if you just do the tiniest simplest thing of redoing the narrative <laughs> it's a whole different world right um and so then the other part of that that brings in for me also that feels so important and so alive and i would love your thoughts on this is to me <clears throat> myth and story are living beings as opposed to static statues or something right so like Sharon Blackie talks a lot about this um and I'm sure you're familiar with her Katrina <laughs> I don't know Vanessa do you know who Sharon Blackie is yeah yeah so a lot of us know her um and she does lots of story re and landscape related stuff um around the feminine but <clears throat> uh it feels so important that we to me that we continue to be story 
like the, the we are story as opposed to there's a story we read in a book and we retell it over and over again the way that it we think it was told and also there feels like there it to me it feels like there needs to be a balance that we don't want to say well actually the myth of saturn is this thing that i just made up i think a balance in there is to recognize what what saturn has been told as and then maybe to feel in our own ways how that myth can then be alive in this moment um anyway that's a whole big topic but i would love your thoughts on any of that okay um wonderful great wow um okay um, <laughs> first i'm fascinated by the fact that that oral storytelling is resurfacing in these times in in great britain very strongly absolutely amazing i'm so grateful i was led to scotland which led me to open up this whole storytelling thing for myself and now i'm discovering the community in germany which is also existent but we've we've started a bit later um but it's my belief that this is precisely because in consciousness we are now at a stage where we understand that the fixing on stuff such as writing down story is is helpful only to a certain extent so oral storytelling is the oldest art form we have my my own teacher daniel allison says uh humans are storytelling apes <laughs> and since time immemorial we've sat around fires and we have shared stories and these stories were then committed to memory and they were also allowed to to shape shift according to the level of consciousness at the time and the context and this is what i'm finding on this this goddess journey is context is becoming so much more important to me than it has ever been and I want to give, again, maybe a specific example because I feel that narrows it down enough and makes it maybe more tangible for people listening. So the last goddess I have been working with was Mary Magdalene because I felt, okay, Easter is coming up and she's knocking. And she's been part of my life for a long time, surfacing at interesting times, <laughs> bringing her own medicine to my life, teaching me different things. And now it this this was a very deep encounter and I did an extensive research like I went <laughs> all the way in and I found that context here is a very important thing I had no idea before I started this research that there are many many more testaments than the four that we know in the bible the gnostic texts found at Nag Hammadi in mid-century, last century in Egypt, um, are incredible. And along with those findings, there has been found a gospel of Mary Magdalene. And diving into this and researching this, I found that what happened is that the four gospels we know simply had the luck of being framed the way that the Romans wanted the story told. So a story is one thing, and who tells it is just as important. Who tells it and why? And with Mary Magdalene, I found that there's so many, and great shout out to all the beautiful souls who have done work on this goddess before, because it's amazing from channeled texts to science like to to the detail footnotes and all and i've come away from this specific storytelling with the information that christ without mary magdalene does not make sense and they knew it both of them knew it 
why am I saying this? And it, this goes out with all respect. Whatever you believe is fine. This is only my world, my findings. But they reenacted an ancient story. And it is the story of the sun god diving into the realms of death, resurrecting through the powers of a goddess. And if you go back long enough, you find from Isis and Osiris to many, many others, there is the same symbolism <laughs> being used. And we have had the, I don't want to call it a misfortune because everything is, is destined, but we it, this, this has shaped the past 2000 years much more strongly than we are aware, much more strongly that this story has been told to us only halfway. And when you read the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, it's just, it's the most beautiful thing. <laughs> because it makes apparent, she, she received his teachings that the Christ is inside us. The, the death and resurrection happens within us and we do not need somebody else to do it for us and if you in, in from my point of view if you if you read the bible in a specific way you find that it's still in there too but it's really really hidden but this is this is the mystery and if you leave her out you leave out 50% and this has shaped our world. And this is, this is at the core of everything to me. Every struggle that we are facing at the moment with whatever you want to call it, awakening or rising or coming, re-becoming the one. If we do not find this trace of her, of the feminine powers, of the feelingness, of the sensual whole i could i could do a whole talk on mary magdalene and the fact that what's hidden behind the prostitute framing is a sensuality is a sacred sexuality that that is nature and we have suppressed it or we have believed that it is evil and we have been hoodwinked into destroying the planet because we have been told a story in a very one-sided way. So that might answer some of your questions or open up more, I don't know. But this is the most recent thing to me. And it's just, I'm so grateful that I am allowed to go on this path. And what Mary Magdalene has brought to me this time was a massive awakening from, you know, blaming the masculine side or or a perception that okay now we have to put women on you know women are better and wow we've been mistreated so badly and and all this and i've moved into wow we have to now become one we are equal we are yeah and i found a beautiful book that i want to recommend to anybody interested in this and it is called the forbidden female speaks by pamela cribb and I'm privileged to um, enter a project where I, I get to do an audiobook, make an audiobook out of it. And it is a channeled text from Mary Magdalene. And it focuses exactly on this, on both the masculine and the feminine having wounds that we can only solve if we address the opposite sex within us to the biological sex that we have been given or with whichever that we identify as. And it's powerful and magical and please read it. <laughs> wow, that I just had chills, like literally all through my body as you were, you know, speaking to Mary Magdalene's story. And as someone who, who grew up Catholic, and just really, you know, deeply steeped in the stories of the Bible. And, you know, at that time,
time, you know, during childhood, not really, um, really even catching the, the patriarchal lens, you know, that that is told through. Um, but later on, you know, like wondering, okay, well, who is Mary Magdalene? And, you know, why, why, where, where is her story here? Why is there so, um, so little told about who she is and why she just appears there? And so I love that you're bringing that out and the book recommendation, I'm definitely going to go. And can you say the name and the author one more time, just so that we are sure to get that I will. Yes, the book is called The Forbidden Female Speaks uh, by Pamela Cribb or Pamela Cribbe. I think she is a uh, she's from the Netherlands. And please stay tuned because there will be an audiobook, both in English and in German, with my beautiful voice um, coming mm -hmm. when we manage to do this and, and sort I... of talk, talk about how to set it up. But I'm so excited because this, it's powerful and beautiful and I please everybody read it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, what... Sorry, no, um, I just wanted to respond to you, Vanessa, because I, I share, like, uh, you were talking, Martha, about you know, story, we are story. And that's also something I'm experiencing with Mary Magdalene, because you see, I am the daughter of two Lutheran reverends. Both my parents studied theology. My father led a parish for 20 years. My mother did, you know, uh, marriages and funerals and whatever. And, and Mary Magdalene has made me face what kind of a story do I still think I am and there's this whole like every goddess that I work with shows up in my life in so powerful ways and I over Easter I went to Taizé which is a French uh, Christian community that is very well known in Europe and that used to mean a lot to me and I felt oh I need to go there I need to replenish my soul and all these concepts and I arrived and it didn't work I arrived there and I didn't feel a thing. I could not relate anymore. And and uh, the strongest feeling I had when I was set, sitting there in the garden uh, carving a Mary Magdalene statue because I carve one goddess each month as well. Um, and that's when I felt something. But sitting in that church, I just, I, 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 I had become a different story, literally. And it's been quite a purge. <laughs> and my body has really had some work to do I was quite ill last week because this had to move out this one-sided masculine Christianity, not including the body, not letting joy come through for me. It just doesn't work anymore. And I have to address this or else I'm going to not be able to move forward. And so I, I can strongly relate and, and yeah, I just, I just, want to invite everybody just no matter what you, your beliefs are you please do keep them and open up the lens because it's even more magnificent than you've been told <laughs> the story is much more beautiful much more life-giving and yeah I just wish that to everybody no matter what the belief story is that they find powerful in themselves. One of the things coming up for me that I was feeling so, so passionate about, <laughs> I wanted to say it's related to what you're talking about. When you're describing the, especially the Mary Magdalene story, I feel this rush of energy wanting to move through my body, right? Like a lot of this feels very body centered. And so there are a couple layers there for me. One is, um, it feels to me like there's a parallel, a parallel shift when we, when we engage with storytelling, when we engage with even just being with stories and narrative as ourselves. Um, I mean, that in and of itself is a powerful shift to be making, but it also, I think, 
can bring us into our knowledge through our bodies and through our being that we can't necessarily get through the mind right and like to let to let the life force of existence be what's driving things or like moving us as opposed to thoughts um and also to let our bodies be the 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 actor or the actress as opposed to our brain uh, not that our brain is bad not that our thoughts are bad but right like and and then the other part is <clears throat> when you are talking about Mary Magdalene and how Jesus wouldn't, I don't want to, I might be getting your, what you just said it was slightly off, but I think what you said is that Mary, without Mary Magdalene, Jesus wouldn't have been Jesus. Is that what you said? Something like that close. <laughs> um, well, anyway, bottom line. What I'm also feeling in me is that when I engage with the stories of the divine feminine, which I do a lot in my own work, like I'm channeling a book called The Goddesses Speak, <laughs> so, and I lead a goddess series, right? Um, and when I hear a story that where the, the feminine is relegated to, quote unquote, just the wife or just the sister or just the daughter or whatever, and her story isn't fleshed out. I feel in my own body, like myself getting kind of shut down. But then when I engage with the goddess as the full goddess, that is her. I often literally like this morning, <laughs> today, we happen to be recording this in April of 2023. And today, this afternoon, I'm giving a talk on the goddess Eris and her counterpart Xena with the Eris Xena Kuiper belt object in astrology. But um but I'm feeling this literally the in my prayers today, the power of existence was trying to move through my whole body because that's a big part of what the Eris archetype is for me. And so it was like suddenly I could I could come alive like all of all of me could come alive through engaging with this goddess as opposed to a more patriarchal version of her um i had a, a male astrologer say one time to me um actually well anyway long story basically he said sorry ladies eris is a woman scorned that was how he summed up the archetype of eris and i was very offended for very many reasons in that moment but I kept my calm <laughs> and my response to that is I'm giving this talk <laughs> that's how I'm channeling my anger because <laughs> I'm going to give my own version of it and I'm going to let that power that full power that she is come through me right I'm um, not in an angry way I mean, in, a, in a it's actually very heiress like it's like I have rage <laughs> and I'm going to channel it as sacred rage by being a voice of that power and that truth for me um that i feel is in service of the greater good right so so there's something about like suddenly un finding traces of her right let's just i think it's the same idea and yeah and if i if i didn't have access to that i would i would feel shut down as opposed to literally feeling like the power of existence which is what we are yeah Anyway, I'm very passionate in case you can't tell. <laughs> that makes three of us, I do believe. Yeah. 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 Um, feel free to well, comment. I, I, I just wanted to mention that three, th there have been three um, kind of areas that have been lit up for me throughout this discussion um, that you have, have, have brought forth for me. Um, number one, just the, the need for the balance in storytelling between the masculine and the feminine, and that it's not, it's not about, okay, everything has been very patriarchal. So now we have to go to the other extreme and be very matriarchal. It's about the balance 
and the weaving together of both of them. And the second piece that um, really spoke to me, and I think it's because I just haven't heard it in this way before, and, and both you, Martha, and Katrina have spoken to this um, in a, a really clear way, and that is that stories are not static. And though I think we all know this, it's again something because the last 2000 years have been um, you know, very focused on the masculine. Um, you know, that's kind of what I grew up feeling and thinking was that a story is a story. You know, this is the way it was, you know, this is the story and it, you can't change that story. Maybe you can tell a new story, but that story is that story. And so, you know, when, when you spoke of it as shape-shifting, um, you know, that really made so much sense to me that stories evolve, stories can shift and change. And there are pieces of stories that can, that can come out that, you know, we're there all along, but maybe we just didn't see them. Um, and so that whole idea of uh, stories being able to shape shift and that we can direct that or we can express that shape shifting. And then the third piece, um, which, you know, Martha, you were just speaking to, um, but Katrina, I think you, you kind of, uh, brought us to this place of, of feeling the story um, in the body, you know, of having uh, that piece kind of being downplayed through, through storytelling in the past or in some, some segments of society um, where now we can, we can really bring that element of storytelling through our bodies. And I'm thinking, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, what's coming to me is that is maybe one of the most powerful ways that we can connect with our own divine feminine is through allowing those stories to express through our bodies to tap into the feelings that come through these stories. Vanessa, I'm gonna jump in and say something because you won't say this about yourself because <laughs> I know that I know that about you. You're very modest. So but of course what's coming up for me is your own work <laughs> and and your your work with body knowing and movement and and the talk that you gave and the workshop you're doing on um, belly dance as sacred practice and having the divine feminine, having belly dance be one avenue for having the divine feminine move through us. Um, yes, so I just wanna, I wanna insert that because I know I knew you wouldn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Martha, for speaking to that. And yes, you know, I, I do come to that through a different lens, but I think it's the same place. Is that right, Katrina? I feel yes, definitely. And what, what came to mind already when you spoke, Martha, was that um, I also find the process of storytelling is medicine in itself. What do I, what do I mean by that? I've, I've taught courses over the years um, during COVID online, which worked very well, um, which astounded me, but storytelling is a, an art form that, that is easier to, to, to transfer into the web than others. And, and I taught courses and I found that the process of somebody embarking on their own journey as a teller will unearth so many hidden aspects and feelings, aspects of their soul, of their personality. And this is, this is one thing that I also see with oral storytelling coming back. We are embracing our own, how, how do you say that in English? Our own power 
we, we, we are empowering ourselves to speak up again and to allow our bodies to speak again. And going back to Mary Magdalene, like with erasing her has given, has paved the way for the narrative to be our bodies are either evil or useless, where they are actually instruments for us to fully become humanly divine. And that that's what I meant when I said to me, the Christ and the whole resurrection business without Mary Magdalene doesn't make sense because the, the mystery is to be a humanly divine. We're souls having a human experience and we can at the same time be creators. But if we erase the body from that picture, it doesn't work. And so I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And to anybody wanting to learn storytelling, please reach out. Though I say so myself, I, I know what I'm about. <laughs> and I love teaching this because I feel it needs so many more tellers. We need bazillions of people able to tell a story well and to feel it and to embody it and to put it out there without an agenda, without the... I know what it means and I'm going to show you what it means and you have to believe what I say. No, I'm going to lay this out like like just like a beautiful set of clothing and you will choose which sweater or sock <laughs> to pick up and put on. And I love this work so I'd I'd be so happy if if from this I, some people would find their way to me and this is the beauty of it we can do this across the globe like you can you could be wherever you want and and I can teach you what I know and and you can go forth and tell the stories that inspire you. And that's also something I found is oh the beauty of you know having a group of five people and and all five will go into completely different directions of what sparks their what makes them come alive. What kinds of stories, what kind of settings um and it's just oh it blew my mind every time. Because I don't know the outcome, but I know how to unlock stuff to assist people in daring to become a storyteller. Yes. Um, I want to transition to you telling us more about your work and where to find and the workshop you're actually offering as part of the symposium on Friday, June 9th, both live and recorded. Right. So I want to talk about that. But before <laughs> before we wrap up. I I want to say the other thing that's coming to me that's feeling so important. I think you would agree. You tell me. I feel like the 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 importance of storytelling is also uh, that it's an avenue for the earth to speak as us. That's another thing I'm feeling in my body. You know, it was like, uh, so I I channel and I channeled now three books that are published and three that aren't published yet but one of them is called Gaia Speaks and one of the things that that book talks about is that the earth is is trying literally we are co-creators with her right so I feel like storytelling is one of the avenues that maybe she has or the earth has to literally be us through us um because we are the earth and um yeah. So, and, and that makes me think about your series with the bogs and the mountains and the, um, the shore and all, all of that, the, the story of landscape, uh, which is a completely other additional topic that I would love to talk to you more about another time, but, um, that is just so exquisitely beautiful and powerful and needed. And I don't know if you have like a brief feeling or thought about any of that oh yes um and i have a specific project that i also want to recommend to people which is very dear to my heart as well so um i don't know if you have heard of the earth charter no many people haven't do look it up the earth charter and it is it is a a framework for a sustainable future long story i won't go into it however it has 
several pillars or principles that it's that it rests on and it and it, everything from you know a uh, fair economy to to education for everybody you know the biological side of sustainability everything and i've been an earth charter ambassador for nigh on 10 years and then i i stumbled across a beautiful man from spain named grian cotanda and he has gone and collected stories from all over the world sharing one commonality and that is that they promote a unified world view they promote the knowledge that we are all one and we are all connected as mm. opposed to the separation narrative mm. wow and this has grown and is keeps growing and expanding and it's called the earth stories collection and if you google that like the earth stories collection.org you find a collection of, I think now, 70 stories from all mythological backgrounds. The attempt is, or the, the vision, the aim is to collect stories from every country, from every culture, every language, um, as long as they have this, you know, we are all one, we are all connected. And this is exactly what you've been saying, Martha. This is Gaia is reminding us that we have been operating under an illusion. We have been operating under a false story. <laughs> and it is a story of power over and of separation and violence. But it is only a story. And the worldview is shifting. And this collection is, a, is, is contributing to that. And there's a network, a growing network, called the earth storytellers so any storytellers listening please do join us um and they are beautiful beautiful stories uh very different from each other and and the, the process is also very respectful and beautiful especially around you know what do you call that in english cultural appropriation i think you know mm -hmm. so original people from australia are being invited and 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 the the process is can we find a way to honor your stories and bring them into this without appropriating them or changing them. Mm -hmm. So often it's also a matter of translation. There are some stories in there from China, from provinces that have never been translated into English and all these things. And that's gorgeous. And that's going on. And some of my teaching work is also based on that. So I teach people how to become an earth storyteller because I also work with a lot of um, nature educators people you know promoting sustainability working with kids or teenagers working in nature conservation all kinds of stuff and so that's also an area that i'm very passionate about um which came before so to speak and led me to now focusing on the divine feminine because i to my understanding this imbalance is at the root of all of this but so that's that's part of that's part of that um I am so excited. Oh, wow. I mean, I can't, I'm having so many reactions internally. <laughs> That's so amazing. I need, I need to connect with that for sure. <laughs> yes. Wow. Thank you. Vanessa, before we start to close out, do you have any other thought or feeling or something you want to ask or? Well, you know, as, as somebody who works you know, with nature and with natural modalities and therapies and healing um, that really touches my heart. And so thank you. Um, thank you for those resources. Thank you for the work that you're doing uh, to help bring about th the balance, you know, the, and the healing that we need through that balance. And I'm really excited to hear uh, more about um, how people can directly, you know, work with you or contact you and your workshop. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, maybe in, in chronological order. So with the Hedge Sisters, with the duo that I mentioned in the beginning, we have one installment left of our current series, and it's going to happen on uh, May 9th um 7 p.m uk and you can oh, find 20, us on eventbrite the hedge UK sisters 23 right so so yes. this so, video will, oh, yeah. <laughs> will 
will run in June of 2020. Oh, yes, that's right. Okay. Sorry. So, yeah. Anyway, but we we are we are working on on uh the continuation of this work. So check out the hedgesisters.com or find us on Eventbrite to see what the next online events are. Um and it will be yeah, a continuation of telling stories about powerful women and spirits and goddesses. Um, yeah, we, we don't quite know yet what, but probably a continuation of the places of her theme. So there's lots more landscapes, right? Like deserts and, and stuff. And by the way, if, if there's still time, I would be most humbled to share a, a short story to just give an example to people, but that we can do that in the end. Um, and then yes, my workshop on June 9th. Is that right, Martha? June 9th. 2023 yes, but it'll be recorded also <laughs> yes it will be recorded so you can check it out later but it's so it's an exploration into the things we have discussed i will be telling a story um and you will with my guidance be able to dive into what medicine this story holds for you and it, there will be meditation maybe some journaling um I will, I will also listen to what wants to happen in the space to, to really make sure that it's coming from the now rather than my, you know, concept, but it will be, yeah, it will be a mix of personal exploration and powerful story and sharing to the extent that people are comfortable. I can't yeah. And so it. my own work, you can find uh, on my website, which is dot. De. There is an English version of the site. However, at the moment, my main focus is in German. I'm I'm building my English stuff, so please bear with me. And um, for anybody speaking German, please check out my Goddess project, which you can find in my shop uh, on my music website, which is katriona.net. Um, and yeah, it's never too late to embark on that. And yeah, you can. Um, uh, you can order my newsletter and and stay informed and you can find me on Facebook, Katriona Blanke Storyteller. And I get a sense that from this discussion, new ideas might develop. So if you follow Martha, you might find me along the way at some point. <laughs> I think so too. I feel lots percolating. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. And I just, on a, on a logistical level, I want to say that so if if this workshop is calling to you there are three different ways you can access it um and like i said it will be live on friday june 9th 2023 um uh in the morning uh, pacific time evening for you katrina <laughs> uh but uh but then it will also be recorded and so you can access it anytime in the future you can buy just that workshop if it's the one and only one that you're feeling called to and they're becoming the one set of paid workshops or you can buy all of the 13 ish uh workshops for rebecoming the one as a bundle or a third option would be if you are feeling really called specifically to the the three workshops that are going to be held on June 9th uh, for the Divine Feminine, which includes this workshop with Katrina. It includes the belly dancing with Vanessa. And it also includes um, a beautiful, amazing workshop with Kelly Hunter, a very well-known astrologer who uh, it's an incredible honor that she's doing this workshop and she's going to be focusing on the cosmic feminine, um, specifically looking at the moon, Venus and black moon Lilith in the astrology chart. And that's a really wonderful workshop for people who know nothing about astrology and people who are professional practicing astrologers. So those are the three that would be included in the divine feminine bundle. So those are the three ways you could access this Katrina's workshop. Um, and I'm so excited that I get to be there and hopefully Vanessa, you can be there too. <laughs> It'll be really wonderful. Great. Um, yeah. So do you have a short story you want to close out with? Yes, I do. I was, when I was walking out there in the rain today, I, I sort of asked, okay, what, what, and I, I did get an answer. So Picture 
a vast desert. Red, hot sand, wherever you look. Rocks and a blue sky with a scorching sun. To the untrained eye, this landscape is dead. There's nothing there. But for those with eyes to see, it is alive, very much alive. There are reptiles, little plants, and there is the wind above the desert, whirling, twirling about. To one side, there's a formation of rocks, and next to the rocks, there is a very old, gnarled tree. And at the foot of that tree, there is a tiny well. Just, just a few droplets of water, so tiny, but it's there and it's alive. One morning, the little well woke up from a sound going, <laughs> little well, little well, have you heard, have you heard? It was the little wind coming to give her the news. Have you heard? Oh my God, the water hole, you know, across there, the, the water levels are sinking and the animals, they're having to really crane their necks to actually reach the water. It's terrible, terrible, terrible. And with that, the wind had disappeared. When the little well heard that, she was so sad. How terrible for the animals. I have to do something. I have to help. And with that, she reached down into the ground. Deeply. She drank from her own depths and spat the water in the direction of the waterhole, only to see it falling short by one meter or so, dropping in the sand, disappearing. Oh. But she was exhausted so sad and exhausted that she fell asleep. And she was woken the next day by a sound. <laughs> little well, oh, little well, have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard? The water levels, they're sinking even more. Now there's just a tiny puddle on the, on the bottom of the water hole and the animals, they're having to creep in into the mud and oh, so dangerous. What if they get stuck, 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 stuck? And with that, the little wind had moved on its way to bring the news to somebody else. <sighs> when the little well heard that, her heart became so heavy and she thought, oh, I just, I didn't try hard enough yesterday, but I will today. I will help. Somebody has to do something. And then she reached down into the ground, down, down, even further down than yesterday. <laughs> And she spat into the direction of the waterhole. But the water didn't even reach as far as yesterday. Halfway, it fell into the sand, creating a sparkling rainbow before disappearing. Oh, the little well felt terrible. Felt as though she wasn't good enough, not doing enough, but she was exhausted. So she fell asleep. She felt like she had not slept long at all when little well, little well, little well. The wind was back and he said, the animals are leaving. They are leaving the area. There's no more water. They're going through the desert. So dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. What if they die? And the wind had gone. Little well was so sad. And she got all her resolve and she said, I'm going to try harder today. I will do it. I will reach as far down as no well has ever reached and I will fill that water hole. Just you wait. <laughs> the water fell right at her feet and disappeared into the sand with a sizzling sound. When the little well saw this, she felt 
her little well heart break in two. And she decided to cease flowing. And just as she was about to cease, she heard a voice. Little well. It was the old tree standing right next to her. Little well, are you actually wanting to give up? Well, well, yes, I'm useless, ain't I? I, I just... It's no point to my existence. I can't even save the animals. It's, it's better I weren't there. Little well, said the tree. Look beside you. Right there, on your side, look. And the little well looked around and she saw, right next to her, there was a tiny flower. It was one of those roses of Jericho. You might know them, grey and shriveled and dusty, and they don't look anything much. But when water reaches them, they bloom, and they give up their seeds for the wind to carry them away. So, so what? said the well. If you cease to flow, said the tree, this little flower will die. Do you want that? Well, no, but there's no but. It isn't your job to water the whole desert. The water hole isn't your job. That flower, however, is your job. It is said that the little well continued to flow. And it is said that the rose of Jericho bloomed in the brightest, beautiful colors. And it is said that when the little wind came again it picked up the seeds and carried them to a faraway land where they sank into the ground and bloomed again but that is a different story wow now i'm really gonna cry <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <clears throat> that was beautiful and you had me like in every word of that story <laughs> it was it was lovely thank you so much for sharing that with us um and i think it it gives us just a small glimmer of what really great storytelling is all about. Yes. Thank you. It's been a privilege and an honor. I've enjoyed this so much. And thank you for giving me the, the chance to to share, to share my gift, because that's what I'm here for. I really wish to to have an impact and and do what I can to restore, help restore this balance. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. And Martha Oh, I look forward to everything. The whole symposium is going to be an amazing, magnificent ball. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I'm very excited about all of it. And yeah, I'm just kind of speechless after that story. It's, wow. Just uh, let it sink. Yeah. <laughs> it will, re it will uh, weave its own magic in its own time. <laughs> I feel it. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to, I can just feel there's lots more to come uh, with you, with collaborating. I can imagine collaborations of the three of us and beyond. And um, But June 9th, that's the next thing coming up. And to everybody watching, please join us if that's calling to you. It's like, I'm on the verge of crying. <laughs> I really cannot wait. <laughs> it's so good. Thank you.